Thank you, Rob. Thank you, choir. It was beautiful. Great. Let me confess that I am not a particularly good gift giver. One year I gave Chandra a sewing machine for Valentine's Day. That didn't go over very well. She wanted a sewing machine at that time, just not for Valentine's Day, you know. And our tradition at Christmas, the way the adults exchange gifts is all the guys buy for the guys and the girls buy for the girls. And you buy what you think is your favorite thing and then you just buy it for all the guys. So you really only have to buy one gift and then you give it to the four guys. I confess that I bought those gifts earlier today on the way to the church. They're <laughs> sitting in my truck. Not as an intention of a sermon illustration. This is just the way it is. And I'm not that I don't try to be a good gift giver, although certainly I could put in more effort than I do at times. And I'm not asking you to cut me any slack. I mean, if I'm supposed to get you a gift or uh, that type of thing, certainly don't cut me any slack. But it's just not my thing. It's not my love language. I appreciate people who are good gift givers. My wife, Chandra, is a really good gift giver. She is motivated in that area. She is creative, thoughtful. She knows what to buy. She gets it early. I mean, she has hit it out of the park a lot of times. My mom is a really good gift giver. My dad, a little bit more like me. If all that anybody gave him for Christmas was a chocolate bar, and that's all he had to buy for anybody else, that would be okay with him. In fact, that would be preferable. But giving gifts is a good thing. I mean, our participation in gift giving is a good thing, particularly at this time of the year, that we give gifts as expressions of love to people that we care about. But gift giving is also a reflection of God's gift to us in Christ. And we honor that or remember that as we exchange gifts with one another. And gift giving... It's also an important thing for our country, for our culture, for our economy. People spend a lot at Christmas, and that uh, bolsters the economy. It's, it's a good thing. People track what people spend at this uh, time of the year. In fact, my older brother was reading about this last night. And on Super Saturday, which is the Saturday before Christmas, we set a new sales record. Thank you all for participating in that. <laughs> Anybody have a guess? Through the till went $34 billion on Saturday. There's a Black Friday, I think, on the left, or, or a average holiday, Black Friday, Cyber Monday, yada, yada. The last one there, Super Saturday, $34 billion. It's part of the economy, gift giving. It's good that we participate in it. Calvin of Calvin and Hobbes seems to know this and tried to use it to his advantage. He says, uh, Dad, I want to have a little talk. Okay, he says, as the wage earner here, it's your responsibility to start buying things that will get the economy going and produce uh, profits and, and employment. Here's a list of some big ticket items I'd like for Christmas. I hope I can trust you to do what's right for our country. <laughs> Dad says, I've got to stop leaving the Wall Street Journal lying around. But gift giving is good. I mean, it's good that we participate in this. I, am I suggesting that we overdo it on the hustle and bustle of, of Christmas? No, but I think it's important that we involve ourselves in that. It's a good thing. Gift giving is a good thing. I think the problem comes is when we assign too much meaning to the hustle and bustle. We, we end up focusing so much on the hustle and bustle of Christmas and decorations and gifts and all of that that we miss the hope and peace and joy and love that Christmas brings. Because the hustle and bustle will eventually end in disappointment. This is just the way it goes. And after all the gifts are exchanged and the meals eaten and the relatives have left and the decorations are down, the post-Christmas blues will set in, a kind of post-Christmas funk, post-Christmas depression, some people call it. It's a thing. 
The hustle and bustle just does not produce hope and joy and peace and love that Christmas brings. And so I think it's important that we, we do our best to focus on, to take time to remember what is the real meaning of Christmas, God's gift to us in Christ. And it's good that we, we do things uh, in order to focus on that. We come to service, we light the Advent candle, we read the story with our, our kids. It's a good thing. And we encourage one another to do that. And one of the ways we do that or one of the phrases that we use to encourage one another to remember the real, real meaning of Christmas is the phrase, keep Christ in Christmas. You've heard that. You see it on people's lawns or on the Internet or at churches. We use that phrase. And, and, I, and I think that's helpful. There's some, some good things there. But we work hard at it. I mean, if you look on the Internet, you can find three ways to keep Christ in Christmas. Six resources that will help you. Seven ways to keep Christ. Ten ways to keep. Twelve ways to keep Christ. Fourteen ways. Fifteen ways to keep Christ in Christmas. Now, I, uh, if it seems a little overwhelming, don't worry, because you can also find 15 low-stress ideas for a christ center. Don't work too hard at it. Twenty-one ways. Twenty-five ways. 30 ways to keep Christ in Christmas. And then if you get there and you feel like, I mean, all that, we just haven't quite got there. We just haven't quite kept Christ in Christmas. Well, then you can find how to really keep Christ in Christmas. It's not what you think. Look, there's some good things there. Even though I poke a little bit, there's some some good things there. But I think the problem is sometimes we can assign too much meaning to it. Sometimes we can get so caught up in keeping Christ in Christmas that we miss the hope, joy, peace, and love that Christmas brings. Because working hard to keep Christ in Christmas will eventually end in disappointment. And after the Advent candles have been extinguished and you've put away the decorations and you've passed the, finished the opportunity to minister somewhere and the new year sets in, you'll start thinking to yourself that there's more to do. That it's not about keeping Christ in Christmas. It's about keeping Christ in our lives at all times. And you'll think... Maybe we didn't do enough to keep Christ in Christmas. And there's still more to do now. We, we worry about this. That we're going to miss the real meaning of Christmas. We're going to miss Christmas. Here's the thing though. You cannot miss Christmas. Because Christmas is not something that you do Christmas is something that was done for you. And maybe this Christmas you have been so part of the hustle and bustle that you've missed the hope, joy, and peace. You have not experienced the hope, joy, peace, and love that, that comes from Christmas. Maybe you've gotten so wrapped up in keeping Christ in Christmas that you've not experienced the hope, peace, joy, and love that comes from Christmas. Or maybe the circumstances of your life are such that just hope and peace and joy and love are hard to find. And it's just difficult in the circumstance that you're in. The message of Christmas is that God is in it with us. That God understands what it's like to be us. That He put Himself in our shoes. That wherever you are, that God is there too. That He understands what it's like to be you. And I hope the reminder of that will be a source of hope and joy and peace for you. Christmas, it applies to you, it applies to me, it applies to all of us. We just read about the shepherds. And there's some debate about the shepherds and their standing in society um, at that time, but I think most would agree that the shepherds were fairly low on the socioeconomic ladder, maybe at the bottom of it. 
and yet the message of Christmas came to them first. I bring you good tidings of great joy, the shepherds, or the angels said to the shepherds. We just read about the Magi, and there's some debate about that. We don't really know who the Magi were. We think there were three, but the scripture doesn't tell us that. We only know that because of three gifts. But they had traveled a great distance to get there. They captured the attention of King Herod. Clearly, they were people of some means. I think everybody would agree that the Magi were fairly high on the socioeconomic ladder, maybe at the top of it. And yet, the message of Christmas came to them first. Probably at the same time that it came to the shepherds. They just had to travel to get there. We just read about Simeon who was this man in Jerusalem waiting for the consolation of Israel, waiting for God's intervention on behalf of the Israelite people. And the Holy Spirit had told him that he wouldn't die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. And we don't really know how old he was or how long he had waited, but we know that the first thing he said when he saw Jesus was, Take me now, Lord. I, Lord, you can dismiss your servant in peace. He had waited enough that he was ready to go. And though he was waiting for the consolation of Israel, he said, My eyes have seen your salvation, which you prepared in the sight of all nations, the light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel, that it wasn't just for Israel, it was for the world. That whether you are poor or rich, whether you are young or old, whether you are a Jew or a Gentile, the message of Christmas applies to you. It applies to all of us. You cannot miss Christmas because Christmas is not something that you do. It is something that was done for you. So if you're a good gift giver, I pray that you involved yourself in some way in the hustle and bustle of Christmas, that you exercised your gift of gift giving. And in that, I hope that you were reminded of the hope, joy, peace, and love that Christmas brings. Maybe you spent a lot of time this Christmas trying to keep Christ in Christmas. And Maybe you read the Christmas story and lit the Advent candles and served at a homeless shelter and all those things are great and I hope that in the midst of it that you were reminded of the hope and peace and joy and love that Christmas brings. Maybe you're in a situation in which it's difficult to find hope, peace, joy and love. I hope that the reminder that God is in it with you, that God understands what it's like to be you, that he suffers alongside of you, that he rejoices alongside of you, that he knows what it's like, will be a source of hope and joy and peace and love for you. And for all of us, after the hustle and bustle and is over and the keeping Christ in Christmas is over and that disappointment sets in, I hope that what Christmas brings, hope, joy, peace, and love, will linger long into the new year. Because we'll get into the new year, and there will be distractions. There will be things that come again, temptations that you need to earn God's love, temptations that your worth depends on what you do and what you accomplish. And you need to be, I need to be, reminded of God's love for me. And if I can put in just a little plug, wherever you are, whether you're here or you're somewhere else, I go to church every Sunday because I need the reminder that God's love for me is unconditional, it is unlimited, and it is unending. That my worth as a person does not depend on my achievement or my accomplishment, that I don't need to earn God's love, that He's given it to me freely. I go to church to be reminded of that because I forget. And I end up slaving away and the pressure is on my shoulders. 
and I need to be reminded. So what I encourage you, I think you find at church the reminder of God's love for you. Christmas is not something that you must do. It is something that was done for you. I hope you rejoice in that. We make Christmas too complicated sometimes. The hustle and the bustle or the keeping Christ in Christmas. I mean, even for me, I, I, this, is, this is a big night, right? This is Christmas Eve. Everybody comes on Christmas Eve. It's more well attended than Easter, right? And we thought, what, what do I say on Christmas Eve? We were talking about this last week at the house and talking about Christmas Eve. And I was like, what am I going to say? It's this. And Adeline, our daughter, was like, just tell them Jesus was born, God loves you, go home and have some turkey with your family. <laughs> I hope what you hear tonight is that Jesus was born as a demonstration of God's love for you. And I hope you have a great time celebrating with those that you love or with us tomorrow at the Christmas Open House. Thanks for being here. Let's pray together. Father, we are grateful for what you have done for us in Christ. We are grateful for your love demonstrated for us freely. God, thanks for these times to remember that, to be reminded of that. Thanks for Christmas when we pause. We connect with friends and family and we celebrate again your gift to us. And I pray that as we get into 2020 that you would long linger uh, feelings of hope and joy and peace and love in us because of your love for us. So thank you for this wonderful evening together. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.